foolishly, I would have thought in the Venn diagram of theatre fans and football fans, it would be quite a niche, tiny amount of people, but not so. This play was an enormous hit at the National. It's true. It was it was a massive hit, and right across all age groups and demographics, which was hugely exciting and important. I started out at 18 um, washing underpants for actors as a dresser. So it was lovely to come back there at the National all those years later and be in front of an audience that represented the nation um, as a national theatre should do. And that was the most exciting thing because when I was there all those years ago, it didn't quite represent, the audience didn't quite represent the nation as it should do as a national theatre. And this production really has. Um, and it's been hugely exciting, and um, so much so we're, we're going off to the West End, which is wonderful. So tell me this, Joseph. I know nothing about football. Uh, what, where's the drama? How how is this a play? What what bit? What what part of the story are we in in this in this production? Well, it kicks off in two. 2016, when Gareth Southgate took over as caretaker t- manager, he'd been with the under um, 21s and he was uh, asked to sort of man the ship, as it were, while they looked for another manager. But then they qualified for Russia and he was invited to become full time manager. But it really looks at Gareth, who is famous for missing his penalty in 96. Um, it looks at the game, it looks at penalties, it looks at fear, it looks at masculinity, it looks at racism. So really, the beautiful game is a prism in which we look at the psyche of the nation. And I think therein lies the drama. And as one of the main protagonists, here you have a man that is quite possibly completely crippled psychologically by all the, 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 the sort of the fallout of missing that penalty, as a lot of players do. Um, and why would he come back and then take a job which is the equivalent of, you know, you know, a prime minister, which is an impossible job, um, and put yourself right back in the centre of, of, of that trauma? But what he did, and he's he's a he's a player that probably came out as as a young man, really experiencing, you know, doors being slammed and bottles thrown across, you know, the dressing room floor to put the fear of God in you to cross over that line and to win. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at fear and masculinity and and winning and uh, and we're looking at a nation that has to learn to lose as well as to win um and so it's a it's a gripping examination i think of the nation's psyche as much as the game and as i say it's a prism in which we look at all these other wonderful uh, uh, um and gnarly subjects and i imagine gareth southgate is delighted by his theatrical glow up <laughs> joseph finds playing him um, <laughs> uh, have, how much time did you how much time did you spend with gareth was he in rehearsals or was he involved in any way god i i i wish i mean our wonderful writer james graham this brilliant prolific talented writer of ours um went up to uh, the fa to st george's and met with gareth i was due to be in that meeting but got bumped um and was asked politely maybe that i I shouldn't turn up which was you know was something i was really hanging my whole kind of research on but i think ultimately it's probably a good thing i think maybe as an actor maybe it's better to talk to people who know him rather than the subject himself because obviously there's i think there might be a mask that's worn and you never really get beyond the mask so apart from looking at countless footage and hours of sky sports interviews Um, I've really gone through uh, and connected with Gareth through James Graham's fictitious rendering of behind the scenes. And there is that sense of getting to the truth through fantasy. And and sometimes if you're too wedded to the character, you can't think beyond it. And there's a beautiful, it's almost caricature uh, and carnivalesque, the play. It's loud, it's, it's funny, it moves at a great pace. So it's not hung up too much on the sort of the methodology of the character and more of the subjects that surround that world. And I know when Frost Nixon was in the West End, David Frost went to see it, I mean, endlessly. <laughs> he loved it. Uh, oh, really? How many times has Gareth <laughs> Southgate been to see Dear England? Uh, not quite in the same way, which might tell you that he's a much more humble <laughs> personality. I think he's a bit of an introvert. Um, I know we've had We've had Ian Wright and Gary Lineker and Ed Miliband and Emma Thompson and Hugh Jackman and all these people have come in and seen it, um, but not Gareth himself. Um, I think it would be a bit odd maybe to be in a play where everyone's watching you, watching yourself. It might be a bit excruciating, <laughs> so I could understand that. But it'd be lovely for him, maybe if he gets some 
silver where he'll feel the pressures off and he can come and celebrate himself. But um, but as yet, no. And a lot of the actors are straight out of drama school. So there's there's a sort of sort of art life mirroring going on, which is wonderful. But their energy and their physicality is is really what makes the show. And we have an incredible cast that cover all all the um, amazing uh, players um, as such as, you know, Rashford and Kane and Pickford and Henderson and I could go on. Um, and they really bring the vitality to the piece. And it's an interesting thing, but, you know, some of them, uh, and I'm thinking about those who missed the penalty in um, in the Euros, and there was this awful, awful backlash against um, three players. And it prompted Gareth to write a letter um, and to reach out to the nation. And the letter was addressed, Dear England, and hence that's where James Graham gets the title from. And it is really reaching out and just reminding people that these are very young players and who adore football. And and as such, it was a turning point where the players then got onto social media. And I think of Marcus Rashford and the, the, the wonderful mural and his work, his social work. So we have a real generation, a young generation, of footballers who are so socially, a, a lot of them really sort of on point. Um, uh, and, and a lot of that virtue came from Gareth allowing that team to reach out socially, to use those platforms, to connect with the audience and to sort of abate the uh, the, the, the terrible backlash that, that, that this country has when it comes to a loss. Um, and what was interesting is, is that in the, the last World Cup, uh, there was a missed penalty by Kane and there wasn't riots and effigies burning and awful abuse online. It was quiet. So what the, this might point to, and of course it can change and the monster's always there, but it might point to this very quiet reformation that has taken place since 2016. Gareth is at the forefront of that, along with Pippa Grange, and she's a psychologist. Psychologist. They brought in a psychologist the first time. It was very late in the day because other sports or had psychologists for a long time. But bringing in and really kind of connecting with the players in a, in, in a way which was highly unusual um, in Gareth's time. And I, I do believe there's been this incredible transition. And that, that's that's at the heart of the drama. And, and the, the transition amongst those young players is, is, is quite a feat. And, you know, England come close a lot. But they're still, still kind of yet to get the big one. Uh, how does the does the play leave a crowd kind of you know? Is it a crowd pleaser, or does everyone kind of limp out of the theatre going, "Oh, that's a shame they didn't win." <laughs> <laughs> well, they they don't. In fact, there's a joyous sense. Um, dare I say, a sort of weird patriotic, um, in in the good sense, let's say. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 of looking at ourselves and celebrating ourselves beyond winning and beyond football really about coming together. And I think the great, beautiful game brings people together. And if we can be brought together in the right way and conduct ourselves, win or loss, in the right way, then that's a wonderful thing. And I think that's what the play reminds us, to have fun, to enjoy ourselves, but conduct ourselves well. Um, and certainly at the end of the audience, you, you feel that. Do we bring any silver? Well, we don't. But we do know there is a Euros looming next year in Germany. And there is a sense within the audience that, especially also, we shouldn't forget the Lionesses, extraordinary yeah. win and winning deep and getting to finals. And we celebrate the women's team as well. And there is that interesting thing about expectation. You know, since 66, there's been this World Cup win and then there's been this crippling expectation foisted on players ever since and if you look at the track record after the 66 there's a lot of times we didn't qualify we came 13th 26th you know 7th 8th 9th if you look at the data there's no reason we should win at all so it's a great reminder of that and yet the women's team with zero expectations have found a flow and a creativity so it's quite interesting about how footballers artists or anyone when you're free of expectation, when you're free of fear, you're not robbed of the joy. And if you've got joy, you can create in whatever field you have. And I think that's what the play kind of aims at. So there's no big celebration at a win. We know that. But there is that sense of finding joy beyond the winning. I love that. You are channeling football manager. You're, that's such a kind of dressing room pep talk. <laughs> Um, oh, I know. I've got my waistcoat on. I can only do it with the waistcoat. 